This year was my first year growing climbing beans, also known as pole beans. I made some mistakes along the way, but from them I learned a lot, and I thought I'd share my journey with you so that hopefully it can save you from making the same mistakes I did. So without further ado, let's begin. I live in the UK, so I bought my seeds from one of the well-known seed companies here called Premier Seeds Direct. They're popular because they have some of the best prices for seeds, at about £1 a bag. I chose six varieties of beans. Two green ones, two yellow ones, and two purple ones. I chose the varieties mostly based on their colour, and I also checked the description to make sure they were stringless and high yielding. One of the things I learned from growing these beans this year was that next time it might be a good idea to look at the description for flavour because this year's beans were mostly very similar in taste. Next year, I'll be looking for the word sweet in the description to hopefully help find the tastiest beans. I also learned that it's worth checking out the beans' maturity times, because different varieties mature at different rates. So some plants may produce beans for you within 50 to 60 days of sowing, and others may take about 80 or even 90 days to produce a bean. So that could be a significant factor to consider when choosing varieties. After some research, I settled on growing 10 plants per person in our household, which in my household meant growing about 40 plants. And that turned out to be a good number for us, providing us with a decent portion of beans all summer. Although 40 plants sounds like a lot, we weren't overwhelmed at any stage and didn't even have any excess beans left to freeze. Having six varieties of varying productivity levels that each reach different peak harvest times at slightly different times helped ensure that we had beans throughout the summer without having any gluts. Having said that, if I'd have sown 40 plants all at the same time of just one high yielding variety like cobra, they would have all matured at the same time and I'm pretty sure we would have been a bit overwhelmed then. If you grow one variety, I suggest staggering the sowing times so that you have different batches of plants that reach peak bean harvest time at slightly different times. And that way you won't be overwhelmed with too many beans all at once. Before sowing my beans, I decided to chit or sprout them. This is absolutely optional, and many people skip this step and just go straight into putting them in the soil. But I wanted to chit them because it was my first time growing them and I was curious to see what the root looks like when it grows out of the bean. I also find it reassuring to know that my beans are viable by seeing them start to grow before putting them in the soil. Once they're covered over with soil you have to wait for anything between 5 to even 12 days before you see anything pop above the surface. So if you chit them you can tell sooner if your beans are viable. Chitting basically involves wrapping your beans up in damp paper towels in a closed container and leaving them in a warm place. Because I wanted to keep my beans nicely labelled and organised, I chitted them in a propagation tray between layers of damp paper towels. And every time the paper towels got dry, I just sprayed them with a mist of water. It took three to four days for the French beans to show signs of roots, at which point they were ready to be sown. The runner beans took a little longer to show roots, sprouting only about after five days. For seed starting of the beans, I used polypropylene 28 cell and 15 cell deep trays that I got from a company here in the UK called Containerwise. You want the deep cell trays for beans because bean seedlings have deeper roots than most of your average vegetable seedlings. Some people use kitchen roll cardboard tubes for sewing, which works too. You can also get root trainers, but personally I didn't want to use these because they're usually made of polystyrene, which has a tiny risk of leaching chemicals into the soil at high temperatures. So even though it's unlikely that it will leach at room temperature, I prefer using polypropylene. trays with pre-moistened fine potting mix. I used the brand Jack's Magic, and then I sewed the beans. The general guideline is sewing a bean at a depth that is about twice its length. 
So if a bean is 2 cm long, you'd sow it at a depth of 4 cm. Because I had pre-moistened the soil, I didn't water the beans in. I'd read that beans don't like to be overwatered at the early stages, and the beans are prone to rotting and dying in the soil if it's too wet. So I just put them on a sunny south-facing windowsill, and whenever the soil got dry on the surface, I sprayed it with a gentle mist of water. Four to five days after putting the chitted beans in the soil, the first sprouts were popping out of the soil surface. This was seven to eight days after I had initially chitted them. Once the beans had sprouted, they grew really fast. By day nine, which is just two days after they first appeared above the soil surface, they already looked like little seedlings with two leaves. This is the ideal stage to start getting them used to the outdoors and to start hardening them off. By day 13, their winding stem started forming. And by day 15 to 16, the winding stem was long enough to ideally be transplanted. As an overly eager to grow newbie, I started the beans in early May, which turns out was way too early. This unfortunately meant that I couldn't transplant the bean plants outdoors when they were the perfect size to go outside, because it was still too cold for them. In early May, the soil was still well below the needed 15 degrees Celsius soil temperature. Next year, I hope to learn from this mistake and only start the beans off in the last week of May which hopefully would mean I could transplant them when they're just the right size. But in my first year growing them, by the time it was warm enough to start hardening them off, the plants were already 17 days old and starting to be overgrown. By the time they were ready to be transplanted, the plants were so overgrown that the winding stems had wound around one another into a messy tangle. I spent longer than I'd like to admit carefully trying to untangle them, which unfortunately also resulted in a few accidental stem breakages. But one thing I did learn from this process was that if you accidentally break the winding stem above the seed leaves, it isn't the end of the world. The plants did survive all this, and they did grow new replacement stems eventually, but it did set them back a little bit because it took a number of days at least to regrow the stems. So the takeaway message from this story is that I'd really recommend transplanting your beans when the winding stem is only two to three inches long at the most and not tangled like mine were. Before transplanting my beans, I did some prep work which involved the following three steps. I chose a site that gets at least six hours of full sun a day and was reasonably sheltered from the wind. I made several four pole X-shaped bamboo frames and placed each one in a 50 cm wide polypropylene pot that was filled with pre-moistened soil. I chose the X-shaped frames as opposed to the regular triangular wigwams because I'd read that with the triangular ones the beans can get a little crowded at the peak, whereas with the X-shape they spread out more so are easier to pick and in practice I found this works well. I found that a four pole structure in a 50 cm pot allowed each pole to be about 8 to 9 inches apart, which is perfect for growing most climbing beans. Remember that even if the four poles may be 9 inches apart, when you sow your seedlings with two per pole, because the plants take up an inch or two of space, the seedlings at each pole end up being about 6 inches apart, even if the poles are 9 inches apart. But a 6 inch spacing is pretty much textbook for climbing beans like French beans. I wouldn't recommend trying to squeeze in more plants with a 5 pole wigwam like I did because I discovered that crowded beans end up producing fewer yields. A quick note on runner bean varieties of climbing beans. If you grow runner beans, I discovered my runner bean variety which was Moonlight not only had very large beans, but it was also a bigger plant with a wider spread of leaves. So my runner bean seedlings were really crowded with the setup I used and as a result these plants hardly produced any beans for me this year. Based on my experience this year, I think if you have a big bean to start off with, it may be a sign that you'll have a bigger plant with wide leaves 
so the plant may be more productive for you if you give it a wider spacing of say 10 to 12 inches apart. If you're using a 50 centimeter pot, a three pole wigwam may be best for these kinds of beans. After transplanting, I added a special straw mulch called Strulch to the bean pots. This product contains embedded minerals that discourage slugs and snails, and it really worked for me. I didn't see a single slug or snail in my beans all season. Mulch also helps the soil retain its water content, which is useful in hot weather. Once I transplanted my beans besides their poles, I learned that you can encourage the beans to wind around certain poles, but sometimes they just want to do their own thing. And even if you start them climbing on one pole, they may cross over to a different pole at some point. By day 36, the first signs of flower buds started forming on my earliest maturing bean varieties, which in my case were the Cobra and the Kentucky Wonder Wax beans. By day 41, the first lilac-colored Cobra flowers and white-colored Kentucky Wonder flowers opened. Over the next few days, more and more flowers appeared. Each flower didn't last very long before it started losing its color, browning and drying out. About a week after the flower had opened, the petals fell away, leaving behind baby beans. Don't worry if initially you see some of the baby beans drop off with the petals. This is normal at first when the plant is just finding its feet with bean production. Every day the baby beans grew a little bigger, and about two weeks after the flower had opened, the beans were big enough to pick. Soon my other later maturing varieties also started flowering and producing beans. It was fun harvesting the different colored pods. I was interested to learn that the plant stems were the same color as the pods, In preparing the beans for cooking, I loved the fresh aroma that came as you chopped the beans. And it was also pretty cool seeing how the purple beans turned from purple to green as they warmed up in the pot. By day 56, most of the bean plants had wound their way up to the top of the 8-foot climbing frames. So that they wouldn't get messy and flop about over the top of the frame, I pinched out the growing tips by twisting the very top of the plant off. I've read that pinching out the tips encourages the plant to grow more bushy lower down, but I've also spoken to other growers who prefer to train the stems back down the poles, and they say that works well for them. In the early days, right after transplanting, don't worry too much if your bean leaves get sunburned like mine did. I think it happens if the plants weren't fully hardened off to strong sunlight. Or it can even happen to fully hardened off plants if the sun is just particularly strong. Although the damage doesn't look very attractive, as long as the damage is just a few spots here and there and not all over 100% of the leaves, the plant can still photosynthesize, and that's the main thing. Early on, after putting the plants outside, I found black fly really liked my bean plants. I tried managing the black fly by rubbing them off with my fingers whenever possible, and when that became too much, I tried spraying with diluted insecticidal soap. But I found that the leaves were quite sensitive, they dried up and became deformed if the soap mix was too concentrated, so be careful with that. Better a little too diluted than too concentrated. You can always make the solution more concentrated if needs be. Also, I found the soap tends to kill the bugs in place rather than repel them away, so I'm not sure it's the ideal solution. <laughs> 
Before next year, I plan to companion plant nasturtiums and marigolds to hopefully help deter the black fly from the bean plant sedassol. I did companion plant them this year too, and once the flowers were there, the black fly problem did decrease. A newbie error I made with the companion planting was that I started the flowers at about the same time that I started the beans. I didn't realize that the flowers take longer to grow than beans, which meant that the flowers were still really tiny seedlings when the beans were ready to be transplanted. And this meant that the flowers weren't big enough to offer any protection for the beans from bugs from the start. Because marigolds and nasturtiums take a while to grow from seed, it's probably a good idea to start growing them about 1-2 to two months before you start your beans. So if you start your beans in late May, maybe start your companion flowers in late March or April. Around day 67, I started noticing that the lower leaves of my bean plants were starting to yellow. Soon after yellowing, the leaves fell off. At first, I thought that this may be a sign that the plants needed fertilizing. Advice I read about fertilizing beans was a bit mixed, with some people saying that you don't need to fertilize beans at all because they make their own nitrogen, and they warned that if you do fertilize them, there's a risk they'll grow lots of leaves but few pods. Others said that you should fertilize, but only minimally, just once mid-season. And yet others said that if you grow the beans in small containers like pots, you should fertilize them every one to two weeks. Honestly, I'm still not really sure which method is correct. If you have any advice, let me know. In any case, I did try fertilizing my bean plants with liquid fertilizer, and instead of stopping the yellowing from spreading, it seemed to encourage it to spread. So I consulted some more experienced grower friends, and they suggested that the yellowing may be linked to overwatering. So I got my moisture meter out and started being more careful about how much I watered the beans. I was in fact so careful not to overwater that I went in the other direction and for a while I underwatered them, which led to the beans curling, shriveling, drying and falling, alongside more leaves yellowing. It was trial and error figuring out the correct amount to water, but I soon discovered that the plants were overwatered when the moisture meter was reading over 7 out of 10 and they were underwatered when the moisture meter was showing below 4 out of 10. The sweet spot seemed to be around 5 to 6 out of 10 for most of the bean varieties I grew, although I think it's possible that some bean varieties may need more or less water than others, so don't take the sweet spot I found as a hard and fast rule. Although my plants sadly lost most of their leaves while I was trying to figure out how much to water them, I was relieved to see that new baby leaves were soon starting to form. It did take a few weeks for the plant to regrow its leaves though, so if you can, do your best not to over or underwater your beans. And get a moisture meter if you think that may help, it helps me a lot. The amazing thing is, is that after losing most of their leaves, the plants were still surviving and eventually bounced back to produce more beans all the way through September and up until October. Towards September, I noticed that the bean leaves started to look more autumnal in colour. The purple bean plants, which previously had green leaves, started developing purple leaves, and although I'd sort of gotten a hold of the watering by this stage, rainy days sometimes meant that the pots got a little overwatered, leading to a more yellowing of the leaves. But now with autumn here, the yellowing felt a bit more fitting with the autumnal beauty all around. By the time October arrived, the plants weren't producing that many new beans, and the ones that were growing were growing really slowly, so it felt like the plant had reached its natural end. It was quite a journey, and I felt like I learned a lot. Hopefully with all I learned, next year's beans will be even better. And I hope your bean growing adventures will be super successful too. Happy growing! <laughs>